kids. I don't know what's wrong with these kids today. Kids. Who can understand anything they say? Kids. They are disobedient, disrespectful oafs. Noisy, crazy, sloppy, lazy loafers. While we're on the subject, kids. You can talk and talk till your face is blue. Kids. But they still just do what they want to do. Why can't they be like we were? Perfect in every way. What's the matter with kids today? Do you know what that's from? It's from a 1960 musical, Bye Bye Birdie. 1960. (laughs) Have you ever had somebody pray for you when you were younger? (laughs) I guarantee you that the older people in your neighborhood, the grandparents in your life, no matter when you lived, No matter if you were a high schooler, 1960, 1970, 1980, 1990, 2000, whatever it may be, I guarantee you that the older people were concerned about you and your generation. Whether it was the bell bottoms and the rock and roll music that you listened to, whether it was the movies that you watched or the TVs coming into our homes, or the mullets that you had, and the flannel that you wore, and and the internet that was being put into everybody's homes and eventually into our hands. Every older generation has thought that the generation to come is it. It's done. (laughs) If they were just like us when we were younger, things would be okay. Every single older generation has felt that way. And conversely, every younger generation has looked at the older generation and thought, what do they have to offer? How outdated, how misinformed. We are the ones who have it figured out. Every younger generation has looked at the older generation and thought, we finally got it right. How can we exist in a community? (laughs) With generational warfare like that. When the older generation thinks one thing and the younger generation thinks another, how is it that we can come together? Well, we really have to ask that question. I think that's maybe step number one, is that we have to ask it. We can't afford not to. What is unique to the time we live in right now is that one of the newest generations in our society called Gen Z, that's kids born 1995 through 2012, they are statistically the least religious generation in American history. That's just statistical fact. And as we look at trends in our society, our, our, our church body, our national church by the Wisconsin Lutheran Synod, did a recent study on our church body's trends. And right now, even the most conservative trends say that in 2065, our church body will be done. It will be too small. And we're not the only ones. A study like we did is what church bodies all across America are doing because everybody's seeing numbers decline. Churches shrink, numbers go away, people who are maybe even raised in the church not coming back again. And so we have to ask ourselves that question, how can different generations come together? Well, it starts by the onus being on the older ones. It just does. That it might be tempting to look down on the younger and think about how they could do things differently and why aren't they more like us. But Christ presents us with a different picture. Christ presents us with a purpose and a means to reach that generation that maybe looks at us and says, what do you have to offer? And through Christ, we can show we have a lot. And so what we're going to do today is we're going to start by looking at how Jesus treated the next generation. 
What did he say? How did he treat those who got in the way? What was a priority in Jesus' mind? That even though Jesus' earthly ministry isn't happening with Gen Z, Jesus did show us how to treat the next generation. And so what I invite you to do is I invite you to follow along as you read just a brief section from Matthew 19. As we begin our talk of looking at how we can be a family-oriented church to bring the throne of Christ in the generations to come. So please follow along. Matthew 19, starting with verse 13. Then people brought little children to Jesus for him to place his hands on them and pray for them. But the disciples rebuked them. Jesus said, Let the little children come to me and do not hinder them. For the kingdom of heaven belongs to such as these. When he had placed his hands on them, he went on from there. This is the word of Christ. A short section, but we see a lot in Jesus' ministry. We see how Jesus was busy, and his disciples knew it. Jesus had people all the time coming up to him, asking them to be healed by Jesus, Jesus preaching and teaching, Jesus needing to just go off and pray on his own. He, he prayed so much. His, his disciples, when these parents brought these kids to him, Luke even tells us there were infants there. They said, Jesus is just too busy. There's too much going on, too much stress, too much happening. This can't be done right now. But how does Jesus respond? He says, no. <laughs> the kingdom is, is for these. These little ones are just as important as the older ones. Just as important as Pharisee leaders, as Roman centurions, as the most famous or, or faithful temple-going Jew, Jews. These children matter just as much. The kingdom belongs to these. And he gives a warning. He says, do not hinder them. Do not get in the way of children coming to Jesus. You see, just before this section that we read in Matthew 18, happened a little bit before what we just read, Jesus talked about how actually the faith of a child is something to imitate. The confident trust that they are willing to place, the humility that they have, and the fact that when you look at, chi at a child, you know that they did not earn God's attention. They have not gotten enough performance under their belt to earn a place in God's kingdom, and yet they have it, and they trust in it. And Jesus said, that's the faith that you need to imitate. And if anybody gets in the way of a childlike faith and a child with faith, it would be better for them if a millstone was tied around their neck and they were thrown into a lake. And so when Jesus says here, do not hinder these little ones coming to me, there is bite behind that warning. You are not to get in the way of God having a relationship with children. Now, you might be saying, well, of course, duh. <laughs> I love to see kids hearing God's word. Love to hear them listening and being at church. We, we love that. Why would we ever get in the way of it? Why would we hinder it? But we have to ask ourselves, we might not be disciples blocking the way to Jesus, saying Jesus is too busy, but what are the things that we do that does hinder it? Parents... Did, we, did you notice what the parents did in that section? The only reason that the disciples turned away the kids was that parents brought the kids. They thought Jesus was so special, so great, so important that they left their work behind and they brought their children to Jesus. To be blessed by him, to know him, to see him face to face. When we let our busyness get in the way of that, we hinder our children coming to Jesus. We might not tell our kids not to know Jesus, but we sure make it hard. 
When during the week we are too busy to talk Jesus with them, to pray with them, to show them how Jesus exists not on a stage at church, but in their hearts and in our homes, we are getting in the way of our children knowing Jesus in a real way. And you might not have kids in your home, but as we have a community, a church family, when we show our parents that, that the sacrifices they make, well, why can't they just make more? When they're here and we give them the weird look, when we give their misbehaving kid the strange eye, when we treat them as if they are a commodity rather than a treasure, we get in the way. And the fact is, when Jesus talks about how to reach what really, in a real way for us, is a lost generation, when Jesus talks about how to reach out to them, he does not say it will be easy. In fact, after that section when Jesus talked about having childlike faith and the warning about the millstone, he gave up what's probably a very familiar parable to you. If you've ever been in church before or heard the Bible before or even heard about Christianity, this is a story that Jesus uses to illustrate that, that you might be familiar with. And we're gonna, I'm going to read through it now. As Jesus talks about what length are we to go through for the next generation. From Matthew 18. He says, See that you do not despise one of these little ones. For I tell you that their angels in heaven always see the face of my Father in heaven. What do you think? If a man owns a hundred sheep and one of them wanders away, will he not leave the ninety-nine on the hills and go to look for the one that wandered off? And if he finds it, truly I tell you, he is happier about that one sheep than about the ninety-nine that did not wander off. In the same way, your Father in heaven is not willing that any of these little ones should perish. How does Jesus describe the attitude we are to have for reaching a wandering generation? We are to put everything down and seek them. To seek them one by one leaving everything behind, whatever it takes, because they are so precious. They're so precious because of God thinking they're precious. That the angels in heaven rejoice over that one little child who repents and knows his Savior. The hosts of heaven praising God over just one wandering child who starts to wonder if God is real and if God really cares about her. When she comes to know God better and see him better, there is singing that we can only imagine. And God says that's the passion we're to have. That seeking and saving and rescuing and teaching and walking along with wandering sheep is what we are to be about. Whatever it takes for that to happen, whatever sacrifices we have to make, because there is sacrifice. But the life of a child of God is about giving up for a better purpose, a better thing. We looked at that in our discipling core value. That the thing that matters most is what God says matters most. And God says those strange sheep matter so much. And so throughout this series, as we've been thinking about what our ministry values are, what, what shapes the things that we do based on these core values that we have, maybe that parable best illustrates the core values that God has. But what God values is you. <laughs> God values you when you start to doubt God values you when you reach back into the sins of your life, the sins that you use to self-medicate, to escape, to forget about the responsibilities that you have. God values you even as you stumble to bring your children to God. God values you, child, even as you struggle to know who God is. God values you more than anything. 
There are no riches that he's not willing to leave behind. There's no glory that he's not willing to set aside for you. And we know this is true. We know it is fact because Jesus is fact. <laughs> Jesus was willing to set aside all of his glory, all the songs of the angels around him. He's willing to set it all aside for you. You as a parent who struggles with the weight of busyness and expectations, you as a church member who struggles to show love to those who are different from you, in a different place in life from you, Jesus came for you, you child, you teen, with the doubts in your mind, the questions that you have. Christ came for you. So you can know without a doubt who God is and what he does. He comes to forgive. He comes to save. He comes to give you something you can't find anywhere else. That's what we want to be about here at Peace. <laughs> we want to be about showing people that God values them. That's what our values are leading us to do. That the reason we have Christ, the reason we have forgiveness is so that we can dwell with God forever in confidence. No matter who we are, no matter what age, what generation we're from, what our past has looked like, through the forgiveness won by Christ, we have a place in God's kingdom forever. God's kingdom is for you. Do not hinder anyone from knowing that. And so what can we do? <laughs> what are the practical things that can happen? Well, first, uh, the fact is that fathers, you have a very special role in this. Apostle Paul says in Ephesians 6, Fathers, do not exasperate your children. Instead, bring them up in the training and instruction of the Lord. Studies have shown that children who grow up as Christians, the ones who remain lifelong, highest percentage, much, much higher, near triple the percentage of those who just attend church, even if they have a church with good youth programs, the ones that stay lifelong Christians are the ones who have fathers who spend time with them and with God. Who, yes, regularly make sure that they are in God's house and in God's word. Whether on Sundays and during the week, that they have a father who talks long gospel to them wants to disciple them. And it's true, it's not a guarantee that all children raised this way will remain in the faith, and it's not a guarantee that children not raised in this way will never come to faith, but this is statistically the best chance we have. Is that fathers do what they're called to do, which is to not hinder their children, but to bring them to the lap of Christ where they can see his face and know who he is and what he's done for them and who he's made them to be. And you notice that there's an extra encouragement not to exasperate our children, right? The two ways, the, the, the two quickest ways to do this, to exasperate our children, even as we try to show them God, is with our hypocrisy and when we talk to them with all law. The old adage is true that more is caught than taught. When they see our lives talking about God and his importance, but they don't see it in how we act, how we treat their mother, how we treat the other children, how we talk about the people in our community, when they don't see those things in line, they catch a lot. And as we want them to follow God's path, because we know it's so good, we want them to show that God is important in their lives. Sometimes we lean too much on the law. And we forget that the gospel is the thing that completes it. But the forgiveness and grace of God is what picks our kids up again when they fall down. When they start to tell themselves that narrative and they internalize it, that they're just not good enough, the thing that's going to drive them out of it is that they are good enough in Christ, that Christ is good enough. And his righteousness covers them over. We, we need to not just give them the law, but the gospel too. Fathers, you have a job to do, but, but mothers, you do too. <laughs> and, and, and we wish that we could take all of our kids and put them in homes that, that had fathers that did this, but not everybody does. But there's an important person in the story that I want to, in the Bible that I want to point you to. His name is Timothy. 
Timothy had a father that did not care about God, knew nothing about his word, wanted nothing to do with it. But yet Timothy would become a pastor. And not just any pastor, but the Apostle Paul is the one who taught him and saw in Timothy so many blessings that he committed Timothy to the church that was so close to Paul's heart, Ephesus. And as he encouraged Timothy, this is what he had to say. He said, I am reminded of your sincere faith, with, which first lived in your grandmother Lois and in your mother Eunice, and I am persuaded now lives in you also. You see, Timothy had a mother and a grandmother in, their, in his life that gave him God's word. Gave him God's word that a couple of weeks ago from this same letter, we talked about how that word is breathed by God. It's useful for teaching, rebuking, and training of righteousness. It's everything we need. Timothy had women in his life who made sure that he was not hindered from hearing that word and being connected to it. Because the Apostle Paul would remind us in Romans, he says this, Consequently, faith comes from hearing the message, and the message is heard through the word about Christ. As we think of those straying sheep and those straying lambs, we think about our purpose to bend over backwards to give them something. Not to give them entertainment, not to give them good advice, but to give them God's word, that law and gospel teaching, that saving truth that, yes, sin is real in their life and real in the households, but grace, grace is real. Grace is more powerful. Grace covers over, and, and it's what they need. As they're filled with self-doubt by what people say about them online, as they walk into schools with abundant pressure to perform and to succeed and to achieve, grace is the thing that will be their rock bed for now and forever. That as relationships change and friends and family and loved ones come and go, God's grace remains the same forever. The only way they know about this is if we do not hinder them. But let them sit on the lap of the Savior who values them so much. So mothers, fathers, grandparents, you value a lot, surely. But in your homes, what are the core values that live there? We've talked about the core values of peace. We even talked about the core values of God. But what about the core values of your home? Is sitting at the feet of the Savior and putting those children on the lap of Christ, is that value number one? Feeding and nurturing that faith with what it needs, is that value number one? Be sure that you have a lot of plans in your life, plans to take your kids on those memorable vacations, plans to see them have the education that they need to succeed. Plans to understand how the world works and plans to enjoy it. Plans to just have the food that they need to grow. Do we have the Jesus plan? <laughs> the solid plan for them to know who he is and to dwell there with him. Because if we don't make the plan, you know it won't happen. Just like how your career doesn't happen without a plan. Just like how your kids don't understand how money works without a plan. They won't understand who Jesus is without a plan. Because the fact is, is that they will be shaped. If we don't shape them with the law and gospel, they will be shaped by the world. They'll have a thousand sermons preached to them about how to use money. Hopefully they learn how to save and they learn how to be responsible. But will they learn how to be generous and to trust God and to worship him with it? They'll learn a lot about how to use their bodies and how to spend their time. But will they learn about how much God values them for who they are, not what somebody feels about them or what somebody says they'll do to them? They won't learn those things without a plan. And so when we think about the core values at peace, families, think about the core values in your home. And think about how God values everyone in your home so, so much. How can we not value him ourselves in our homes? 
And if you don't have children living with you now, please know that you play such an important role in this too. That no matter what your past has looked like, no matter how you have struggled with looking at the next generation, forgetting to do it with grace, with the goal of long gospel discipling, it, you have a place in this family too. Because the children can learn a lot from you. As you have lived this life with Christ, as you have come to know him and who he is, and you've had life experiences where you've seen him and him act, those are things that kids need to know about. Especially the things you'd rather not to talk about. Sometimes we might feel that our regrets and our failures are the things we have to hide from our children. But God says otherwise. You see, there was a moment in that city of Ephesus where Paul's beloved church dwelt, where Timothy was sent to. You see, Ephesus was known for something. It was known for worshiping Artemis a pagan god, and they had a whole business wrapped up into it where they had silversmiths that made these idols and these statues, and Ephesus was known for it, and it was special. But the gospel dwelled in Ephesus, and there was long gospel teaching, and it led to something amazing. And let's look at this from Acts. Many of those who believed now came and openly confessed what they had done. A number who had practiced sorcery brought their scrolls together and burned them publicly. When they calculated the value of the scrolls, the total came to 50,000 drachmas. In this way, the word of the Lord spread widely and grew in power. This isn't a typical Sunday school <laughs> lesson, talking about the sorcerers that burned their scrolls. But by, by an estimate of money, millions of dollars worth of goods were sent up in smoke because people had come to know God. These sorcerers, these pagans who wanted nothing to do, do with God, that when the gospel was first pe being preached in Ephesus, they rioted about it because they hated it so much. But now, look at this city now. Who could have predicted that this would happen? But where the gospel dwells, all things are possible. Where God is working, trends change. And so when you hear those frightening trends about the future of a church body, the future of a generation, know that they're just statistics. Yes, they are reasons for us to take that hunt for the lost sheep seriously, but it doesn't mean that things are doomed. We spent the whole first part of this service talking about how Christ is king. That he has conquered sin, death, and the devil, and that he rules and reigns over all. That's not changing with this new generation. God is still in charge, and Christ is on his throne, no matter what happens to our church or church body or, or whatever. He rules on behalf of you and your children and all those who will come to faith. And that's why we are free to have that childlike faith. <laughs> that faith that does not panic, but trust that has confidence and certainty. We can trust that our God will provide what we need to do this mission he has placed in front of us. That his gospel really does work miracles. And so we want to give our children that confidence, that we want them to continue having that childlike faith, even as we don't want them to have childish faith. This is what Peter talks about. He says, don't have childish faith. He says, instead, do this. He says, like newborn babies crave pure spiritual milk, so that by it you may grow up in your salvation, now that you have tasted that the Lord is good. Childlike faith trusts. Childlike faith craves the nourishment of the law and gospel. But it's not childish. We want our children to sing good songs and to sing how Jesus loves me, this I know, but we don't want them to say, this is all I ever need to know. <laughs> we want them to be fed on, on the things that will make them grow. They'll make them mature. And, and the only way to do that is to show them that we need it too. 
But just because we're older, it doesn't mean we know everything about who God is, but we need to feed our faith just as badly as we want to feed them. Bible studies, devotions, prayer life isn't just a bedtime activity, Sunday school activity. It is a whole life activity. That we make plans to do this together because we need it together. But friends, go with confidence. (laughs) Go into your homes, pursue the mission here at peace, knowing that Christ the King, the reason we worship him, the reason we want him in our homes is that he values our kids and the next generation even more than we do. He values them with a perfect love, brings them in with a forgiveness that, that covers over everything, and promises to bring them to a kingdom that we can't find anywhere else. So let's end today by by focusing on him, his values, his means. As Isaiah reminds us of this, he says, He tends his flock like a shepherd. He gathers the lambs in his arms and carries them close to his heart. He gently leads those that have young. This is the shepherd that tends this flock. This is the shepherd that tends our families. This is the shepherd that we want to bring those straying sheep back to. To know this care, to have these promises, to see that love. Amen. Please pray with me now. Dear Heavenly Father, it takes sacrifice to reach the string. It takes work and effort to teach the next generation. It's hard to equip families with what they need. But Lord, we know this is what you value. Help us to value it too. Help us to be compelled to value it because we know how much you have valued us first. That you set aside all glory to save us, all glory to forgive us, all glory so that we could know your glory ourselves. How could we not follow you? In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.